This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Hi, I'm Nick Ravellis, the Geisel Director of Education and Outreach for San Diego Opera. As you know, we have a number of opportunities for you to get to know opera and our current season by tuning in here to UCSD TV. One of our most exciting offerings is Stars in the Salon. This series is an opportunity for you, our audience, to meet the singers, the conductors, and the stage directors who create our productions. Taped before a live audience, the artists discuss their roles, the music, and the stories behind the operas. It's especially entertaining and informative for those of you who are new to opera. Join us now for Stars in the Salon, and I'll see you at the opera. I would like to introduce our illustrious panel, but before I do, I want to say how often I've heard in the last week and a half or so from each of the artists and the crew that are involved in the production, how they have rarely been together with a group of people as nice as they all are. They're absolutely thoroughly delighted with each other, which is really, really cool. It's all lies. <laughs> yeah, so it's all gonna come out tonight, but uh, <laughs> here we go. So starting on my right, uh, making her debut with San Diego Opera, uh, mezzo-soprano from Bulgaria, who had a long relationship, still has a long relationship with the Wiener Staatsoper, but has sung in many other places throughout the world, including Bayerische Staatsoper, Lyric Opera of Chicago, Dallas, and Paris Opera, uh, mezzo-soprano Nadia Krosteva. She, of course, is singing the role of Dalila. And next to her, our stage director. She's been directing for 20 years and directed 30 productions of the Metropolitan Opera alone. She's the former general manager of San Francisco Ballet, former general director of Opera Boston, and this is her third opera for San Diego Opera, Leslie Koenig. Karen Keltner is well known to us for the many operas that she's conducted here, but she's also guest conducted at L'Opéra du Rhin. Rhin? Rhin? Thank you, that one. Uh, Washington <laughs> Opera, Glimmer, Glimmerglass Opera, New York City Opera, Vancouver and Winnipeg Operas in Canada, and many, many more. Karen Keltner, we welcome you. Uh, singing the role of Samson an artist who has been at the Metropolitan Opera many times, also has sung at the Semper Oper in Dresden, Deutsche Oper Berlin, Dallas Opera, La Scala, San Francisco, and many, many more. Tenor Clifton Forbes, good to have you back here. <laughs> now, this is very special for me. Uh, this baritone, this young baritone. God love you. <laughs> Uh, has sung at the Rome Opera, Teatro Real in Madrid, Opera de Nice, Norwegian National Opera, Athens Opera, Deutsche Oper am Rhein, among many, many others. He, gr he is a graduate of both the University of San Diego and San Diego State University. <laughs> in chemistry. <laughs> Like a bad penny, I keep <laughs> popping up. <laughs> but I have to say on a personal note that um, when I heard the name of, uh, that he was going to be, I said, Anusha, that's such an unusual name, but I know that name. I've heard that name before in my past life. And then it suddenly dawned on me when I saw him that I, I, when I taught at the University of San Diego, my office studio adjoined the office studio of the voice teacher, Robert Austin. And so I used to overhear Anusha's voice lessons. For I've apologized for he's that. He's apologized many times. So anyway, welcome, Anusha Golikorsky. 
So let's get into it, Samson and Delilah. We've pr we produced this same production of Samson and Delilah in 2007 to great success. The audiences really loved it. But we're doing it with a different stage director and two different cast members. When you approach an opera production that you haven't been involved in, in terms of the design process, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, targeting Leslie for Feel this, <laughs> the, the set, the costumes, the props, not to mention the notes and the words, which of course are already given us, how flexible can you be within the parameters that you've been given to make a fresh statement with this piece? I, I think you can be completely flexible. I think. I've directed Samson a couple of times before in my life, but this time I approached it completely differently. Um, when the, I see the sets and costumes, absolutely, I can say, well, you know, the way I would like to tell the story, I would prefer to do this or that, or I have a tendency to, um, uh, in French operas, to cut a lot of uh, props and bits of scenery. So when I, in my former life as a director also, was always called Coupe Koenig because I would cut everything. <laughs> um, but I tend to try, my style tends to be a little bit more pared down and really about storytelling. So there's a lot of leeway. It's just you take a set and you think, okay, and costumes, how can I make the story make sense, especially given the sets and costumes that I have? And there is, the staff here is just incredible. So people will very easily, if we say, I'd really prefer for this person to wear his own hair rather than to wear a wig or to do this or to do that, the uh, crew here is so flexible that you're really able to do pretty much anything you want. So it's enormous flexibility. Well, for instance, I, I overheard a conversation that you had with Anusha about the high priest, which is the role that he's singing. And you were making uh, costume adjustments on I, the fly. and and, and, and what was that about? I mean, wh why are you paring that down? What, is it, what does it do for the story? Well, I think that each of the major characters in the story is dealing with uh, two different things. Dalila is dealing with her love and hatred of Samson, and Samson's dealing with his love of Dalila and God, and the high priest is dealing with the, being the high priest of the Philistines, but also being wildly attracted to Dalila. And when I saw the costumes for the high priest, they were very, very bulky, and there were lots of snakes. <laughs> and um, I thought, all right, um, maybe one snake in one act. But the other two acts, I just thought I really didn't want to see any snakes. And I think that he is very attracted to Delilah, and whether they've had any kind of relationship before or whether they will, uh, we'll see, in terms of being intimate. But I wanted him to be sexy, and the costumes were really, really bulky. So I asked the costume crew if they could pare down what he was wearing, give him a belt, give him a really good shape, and uh, that's what they're doing. So that was our conversation. Like, are you attracted to Dalila? Is she attracted to you? If that's true, which I think it is, let's make him look sexy instead of bulky. Yeah. And fewer snakes, <laughs> fewer snakes. There you go. Um, Karen, do you, do you agree with Adam? Is that, and is that, your, is that your experience of going through the rehearsal process this time? as opposed to You mean fewer time. snakes? Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think you always mold uh, what you're doing to the cast and the ideas you have. And I frankly love the idea of the paring down. It's leaner. It's leaner and we're concentrating on the actual characters themselves. Mm -hmm. Which, again, everything that Leslie does or that these folks do informs what I do. And it, 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 it's a symbiotic relationship that, that works throughout any kind of an opera collaboration. And mm -hmm. so, yes, I do agree. Um, have you discovered something that perhaps you didn't notice before or approached something in the score a little differently than you did before five years ago? Yes, because, because we have different voices. Um, certainly this, this very non-dramatic, calm <laughs> person over here who is Nadia. <laughs> Really, she brings so much passion and so much, so much feeling to the role that that my job then is 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 defined a little bit differently than someone say who is a bit cooler or less involved. Mm -hmm. um, Clifton, it's wonderful to be back with him again, and it's wonderful to see how they interact. But yes, totally, what we do orchestrally or what we do, uh, even tempo-wise, is governed very, very much by what. What is happening with each of these individuals? Yeah. This three opera—it's basically a three, 
three principal singer cast and a huge and wonderful chorus yeah, yeah. and wonderful dancers. I mean, there's many, many facets to this production, but since we're all here and you're asking that specific question, uh, totally, yeah. totally designed to mold to and uh, assist in making each of these wonderful individuals sound and look and feel their best. Now, Cliff, you've sung the role many times, including the last time we did it. Um, so I'd ask, I'd, I'd ask you a similar question. What are you noticing about it this time around that you may not have picked up on before, if that's possible, as many times as you've sung it? Or what are you emphasizing now or de-emphasizing now that you hadn't before? Well, I, I think the important thing is that for, for any singer is no matter how many times you've sung a particular role, that when you go to the, the next production of that specific role, you have to wipe your slate clean. Um, you have to, uh, as, as Maestro was saying, explore the parameters that each artist has in terms of musicality and then infuse the, the drama that the director's bringing to it. And it's completely different. You have to try just as hard to not redo what you've done mm. as you do to assimilate the new processes mm. as well. I think one of the things I guess I'm getting at is not, not necessarily in this audience, but perhaps on our YouTube audience, people who may be having a tendency to say, oh, I saw it five years ago. And it's a, it is really completely different. Yeah. And in fact, if it were the same cast, it would still As be last different. Time. It would still Each be different. Each of us is different yeah. Yeah. from yeah. last yeah. time. Exactly. Uh, Anusha, again, the same question, but what do you bring to the high priest now that perhaps you didn't bring to the role that, uh, before? And you've sung it again many times. It's true. I think I, I went through my, my notes, and I think this is maybe the 12th production or something like <laughs> that that I've done. Um, but as a chemist, I can tell you <laughs> that... <laughs> No, seriously, it, 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 this is a matter of mathematical permutations in the sense that mm -hmm. each one of us is an unknown. Even though we know the part and we know the music and we've all done it, when we put the mix together, it's like cooking, the ingredients marry with each other differently and therefore the product comes out completely differently, although it's the same bread you bake, but every time it tastes just that much different. And what Cliff says is absolutely correct. If you come in as a singer with um, expectations to repeat something, first of all, what's the point of doing it? And um, you never can, even if you wanted to. Because the surrounding, the synergy of the people around you and the sets and the costumes and the city and energy of the company and so on changes the whole chemistry of the whole um, opera, of the performance. And that's the beauty of it. You can actually see four performances and see four different operas, per mm. se. It even changes from night, night to night, not only from performance to performance, <clears throat> which I hope is interesting for opera fans who've seen the opera God knows how many times, and it makes our life interesting. Otherwise, oh God, got to get up in the morning and do this thing. Yeah. And nobody wants to do that. You know? the, the cooking image is a great metaphor, I think, for for what it is that we do. I, I use when cooking we as a metaphor a lot, as you yeah. can see. Uh. <laughs> well, Nadia, now you're, this is your debut yeah. in the role, not only <laughs> in San Diego, but in yeah. the role. So, you know, the question's a little different from you. You've never done it before. So, how does it, it, it a role is very different on, from the page, the studio, and then when you actually put it on in the rehearsal hall and you put it on on stage, it's completely different. Tell us about the experience of a new role for you, of, of this role. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> I mean, you have this wonderful music written by the composer and you have this wonderful crew, this cast, and uh, the people helping us to make a good production. And I think the chemistry between us is very good. Mm -hmm. We're going to be using that word a no. lot now. Yeah. It's, the, it's, it's all about, about chemistry. About yeah. chemistry yeah. <laughs> and and bread. yeah, we everybody we are discovering like small small things, small details uh, in the process. Just 
working step by step and uh, um, Leslie is uh, so helpful that that you feel uh, you feel like you did more or less these things uh, many many times mm. um, she makes you feel safe <laughs> that's so important isn't it and I, I think uh, to feeling safe and it's not we're just not talking about falling scenery but <laughs> we're talking of which happens of course at the end <laughs> The chorus has to be concerned about falling scenes. <laughs> but we're, what are we talking about when, when uh, an actor, actress, uh, a singer in opera needs to feel safe in the process of, of rehearsing an opera? What does that, what does that mean? It, it does mean that, um, that she's always very uh, careful what, what feels good to you or what doesn't feel so good. And she's always... Uh, flexible to change small details or to add something if you have a good suggestions. Uh, so I mean she, she doesn't uh, make you do things that, that doesn't feel that don't feel comfortable or don't feel um, convincing for mm -hmm. you. So for the new and, and the same the same of course our maestra which uh, which is wonderful with us and uh, we create the same way the music together. Mm. Is, there, is there a part of the role that you're discovering is more challenging than you thought it would be when you were studying it on the page, now that you're on your feet? No, it's, uh, it's just right. It's, it fits. It's, it feels good, it fits, and uh, like, uh, like we were talking, it's a music full of passion and full of uh, energy, good energy, mm -hmm. so uh, it opens your heart when you do this thing. It's wonderful. Long phrases. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. <laughs> I think personally this one was created to do this particular role. Uh, I mean, look at her and wait till you hear her. Yeah. Truly, and I'm not trying to <laughs> offer false flattery here, but you are a natural, don't you think? Well, Karen, this Thank opera you. has a really interesting history. Mm. It began as an oratorio. It turned into an opera at the behest of the librettist, not the composer. And then it premiered in Weimar, not in Paris, which is where Sasson, of course, lived and wanted to have a premiere. Didn't even get to the Paris Opera until 15 or 20 years after its premiere in Weimar. Why do you think that the French were reticent at first to accept this piece? Well, the French are a very moderate group of people. Um, except in politics. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I tr at that time, truly, he, this was considered uh, very, very Wagnerian. Not necessarily the first and the second, third acts, but the second act is quite Wagnerian, at least it, it, it's said to the, it doesn't sound like that to us today, but you know, there are little similarities. We, mm. we haven't said the word leitmotif, but we hear snatches of motives throughout this opera that designate a particular character or a particular mood. Um, and the French were much more measured than that. And of course, Liszt was the one, I believe, that championed taking this particular opera to Weimar because he knew it didn't have a chance mm. in France. And even once it hit France, it was not a huge hit uh, as far as its popularity. I think the chromaticism, I think the use of, of of a, a, a lot of the um, atmospheric effects that now we come to accept as French were something in that time foreign to the concept of the French grand opera a la Meyerbeer, for mm. example. Mm -hmm. uh, he also departed in structure from the expected forms. I mean, Absolutely. you were supposed to have five acts and you were supposed to have this, that, and the other, and he compressed things. And the fact that this was such a, a, a emphasis on a chorus and the choral places, I mean, that was not done. That, that didn't belong in an opera house. That was an oratory. And if you're going to be snobbish about it, let's not put it on the opera stage. A number of things contributed to that. And I think um, now with different eyes and ears, we hear it very differently. Mm -hmm. But at that time, I think that's, that's what was going on as far as, I mean, I wasn't there. I'm not quite that old. <laughs> <laughs> I've just always found that a little strange that he, he really struggled with this piece. First of all, writing it uh, and, and in, invited a group of people to come and I believe Pauline, Pauline Viardot mm -hmm. sang the two, two of the Delilah arias right. for he, this audience and no one really thought not much that terribly. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, hard, to, it's hard to believe it's that, it, that they weren't music. immediately struck 
by I those didn't. long, long lines are a little bit exotic, you know, for, for I, I think, that time. I, I, we find it very strange now because it's exquisite music. Yeah. Exquisite music. Yeah, but remember that, for example, the opera Carmen also didn't have and success butterfly. from the first time. So. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. The time um, changes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Leslie, we spend a lot of time in these roundtables talking about opera as music, but I'd like to move to opera as drama for a few moments uh, and ask you what it is that you do first when you've been asked to direct a particular piece. Do you read the libretto, listen to the music, try to picture the movement of the singers in your mind? What's your process in creating a stage version of a, of a piece? In terms of the difference between opera as music and opera as drama, it's both. It can't yep. be one or the other for me. Um, the first time I approach an opera that I've never heard before or that I'm going to direct and I don't know, uh, I listen to it a couple of times, and then I actually um, memorize it. I take, I, I don't read music in the conventional sense, but um, for some reason I can memorize an orchestra score. So what I do is actually sit down and memorize all the words and music until I can sing all the parts. And that allows me to uh, be free then to prepare staging. So what I tend to do is memorize the piece till I can sing everyone's part. Then I think the opera through from each character's point of view. What's he or she thinking right now? And if I get stuck about what one character on stage is thinking, I make myself into the other character. And I think, well, what's she thinking? And that will say, oh, maybe this is his reaction to what she's thinking. So I actually, it, it's pretty easy in this opera because there are only three main characters. When you get into one where there are like 11 main characters, <laughs> it can get a little complicated keeping them straight. But what I basically do is prepare the staging completely for every moment of the opera. And then I play. Because if the opera's in my head and then I've prepared staging, then I'm always on secure ground. And if I find that something happens during the rehearsal that's really magical, they're going in a certain direction, I can play and go with it. But I never will be in a situation where I feel lost because I always know where I'm headed. But if I change where I'm headed, that's okay because I at least had a path. So for me, the, the music and the words together, I really believe in fidelity to the words and music. And Oh, thank you. you know, yeah, I really, you know, if someone says, talks about a tree, there either needs to be a tree or he <laughs> needs to be hallucinating. And that thing needs to be clear or he's joking. But those, one of those three things has to be true. I really, um, you know, this is a set which could be viewed as traditional, but that doesn't mean that the staging has to be that way. And I think it's always a director's choice where and when to set an opera. But the director really is a master storyteller. And I think if it, it becomes... Anything other than that, we haven't succeeded. I would prefer at the end of an opera, when you leave and go home, that you say, I saw Samson and Delilah, not that you, I, that you say, I saw this director's interpretation of Samson and Delilah. I would prefer to be invisible at the end and for the opera to be at the forefront. So for a chorus, which is so crucial in this piece that oh, has- so fun to direct. That has two corporate personalities, the Israelites and the Philistines, at, at any given point in the opera. Uh, how, do you, how do you take 60 individuals, or however, 80, 80, yeah. 80, 80 individuals in the chorus, and sort of direct them to be the Israelites or to be the Philistines? How, what is that process about? That, that is so much fun. I think a lot of directors are really scared of choruses. And I, it's, yes. really, it's really fun to actually <laughs> stage a chorus in another country, in another language, because I speak other languages, but I always make really funny mistakes, and they always laugh at me. And you know, it's, it's who just doesn't? a, but, yeah, who doesn't, right? But um, <laughs> the, the directing a chorus is, it's such a high. It's, it's 80 people, but it's 80 individuals, and having them act sometimes as individuals and sometimes as a pack. Um, and choosing which of those things happens and making sure that they are completely involved in the story, that they understand exactly what's happening. And then what's really great with the chorus is if you know what you want them to do and then give them room, they'll run with it. And that's a, you know, and the worst thing you have to do is calm them down. And in this is, chorus here is absolutely superb. They are top notch mm -hmm. and have, they sound fantastic. And I think that uh, that uh, staging the chorus is uh, it, it's really fun. The difference they are Hebrews in the first act and Philistines in the last act, 
but you really shouldn't tell because they're changing clothes, but, mm. you know? Yeah. So in the beginning, they don't like the Philistines, and in the last <laughs> act, they are the Philistines, but then they get killed, so, you know, it all turns out all right they, at the all, end. All 80 of them have doppelgangers that approach They, they the, all the, have doppelgangers. Yeah. Uh, Cliff, do you notice a difference in the music that Sassons gives to you as opposed to the music for Delilah? Oh, absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, how do you how do you express that 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 difference? Well, I think what he's you know what he's done obviously is is created as 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 my show almost was alluding to earlier the light motif kind of thing. Samson's music is by and large very martial, very you know military in a way. Um, you do get to see some of the inner workings of him in the third act uh, at the grist mill. Yeah. You, you, get, you get to see some of his um, problem areas in act two with the music, uh, the passion that's involved. But I, I think he has set it up, the whole first act, so much like this in order to uh, substantiate the fact that this is a guy who lives by law. This is a guy who exists for the law. And as a judge, he has to, his whole persona is strict, rigid, blah, blah, blah. And when he gets outside of that parameter, that's where he gets in trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's the act two music where he has no control and he has no guidelines or set of rules to deal with his attraction and lust to Dalila. So I think that is, you know, all of her music, not all of it, some of it is is in a way ceremonial in, in Act 3, the, the Dagon scene, but it's so seductive, mm -hmm. which is in, in sinewy, for lack of a better word. It's the complete opposite of what Samson is. And I think by showing the dichotomy of those two two characters vocally, he's also uh, showing the, um, the extremes of their range emotionally as mm -hmm. well. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm asking for a very particular reason because I have this theory that uh, uh, Samson begins in the world of the oratorio that Sasson leaves. Uh, and it, because it seems to me that, 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 that Samson's music in the first act, yes, is very martial, it's very kind of four square, although beautiful, and gorgeous stuff, but it, when Dalila appears, as you say, it's all so sinuous, it's so completely different, it's almost as if the world of the oratorio disappears as soon as she walks on stage. And what happens is that that works to the benefit of the story in that we have what you were talking about, that wonderful dichotomy between those two musical worlds that don't come together until the second verse of Mon Coeur. And then oh, yeah. you've got yeah. this <laughs> going on. <laughs> yeah. And he's joined late. her yeah. world. You know, yeah. it, and it, it just, it, it, seem, it works so, be I, there's something about how Sassons does that that I think is so striking. Don't you agree, Karen? I, it just That's the is amazing. And he takes you there without your really, and I don't think anybody sits in an audience, we're talking about it now, so you may, but, and goes, gee, this first act is definitely an oratorio. <laughs> now we're into opera in the second. I mean, it's no, not done at all. skillfully and with, Sansons was a, he had a huge and wonderful set of tools at his, at his, uh, uh, for, for his use, he was a very skilled composer. He wasn't sometimes necessarily considered a fiery or overly dramatic composer, but he gave that kind of music to his characters. And the fact that he was such a craftsman of his art is exactly how he got from point A into point B and out again. Mm -hmm. And um, we've had some interesting discussions about the quality and the type of music of the third act. I, I think it's, quite wonderful. 
uh, but it has it, it has to be contained. It can it can go overboard a little bit too easily if you're not very careful with it. But again, that's Sasson's and the scope of his talents, yeah. I think. Uh, Anusha, I saw an excerpt from a production of this opera that you did. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, the that's YouTube, that's the on YouTube, YouTube one. Yeah. and let me describe it. It's the duet between yourself and Dalila in Act Two. Yeah. To my great surprise, you roll out from under the covers of Dalila's divan, obviously having been there all night. Beyond what the stage director of that production might have been thinking, do you believe that the high priest is in love with Dalila? You know, I... Um, I think like all successful operas, except for Meistersinger, we shouldn't interchange the word love and sex too often. Yeah. I think that there is an attraction, there is a physical attraction between, Dalila, uh, between uh, um, the high priest and Dalila. There is a lust. Um, it is much more basic, it's much more animalistic than it is cerebral or heartfelt. I think that as all, but I shouldn't be telling you this, you should be telling me this because you're the expert in this department, but all the judges in, this, in the Bible, all these books occur at a time where the God of the desert is trying to make dominion over the natural gods, which Baal was one of. And this has to do with physicality and sexuality. These old, older natural gods were much more lust-driven, oh, sexually yeah. driven. All about um, fertility and all, all of that, yeah. And mm -hmm. this is the situation in the opera with this particular character. Um, I think he's trying whatever he can to hang on, like any good politician would, to hang on to his seat of power. Mm. And Dalila is a tool for that. A First and foremost, she's a tool for that because Samson is also human and a judge. So, sorry, roundabout answer. I think that, that the, the high priest is quite attracted to her. So, going back to this particular staging that you had mentioned, he comes there, and Dalila doesn't, isn't exactly a Girl Scout. <laughs> She no. has a past, you know. She has a past. Well, she has which, a past with Samson, too. And yeah. not only with Samson. Yeah. She has a past, which is why she's useful. She is someone who's useful to me, to, to me, to the high priest. Because if I went to somebody else who might be beautiful, she might say, eh, I don't know, you know, my father doesn't like that. Mm. She is above and beyond that point of prudishness, let us say. So it's a, it's a synergy. And so in this particular production, we discussed this issue. In fact, I didn't want to crawl out of this bed. Mm. It was an Italian director. And of he, course. Uh, I think his name is Fitz. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually convinced me. He said, look, we leave it open what happened or didn't happen there. OK? But you came there, and you laid in her bed. And then, of course, I don't know how much of it is on the internet, because I have never seen it. But this whole scene goes on with lots of massage oils and fruit juice on top of each other and rubbing <laughs> oranges. <laughs> it becomes quite a mini bacchanal. Huh. A, as instructions, what to do with him, and B, to show this dichotomous situation that she is also in, the huh. Dalila. Because this is not a, 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 a unidimensional character by any stretch of the imagination. This is a full-bodied woman. Yeah. In the very same sense that you can always argue whether Tosca would be better off with Scarpia or with Cavaradossi <laughs> if it wasn't for this love business. <laughs> In the same sense, I think that she has also misgivings. I think the second act Aria, the second act music, is full of misgivings for her. She doesn't know whether she wants to ensnare this poor guy until the very end. Mm -hmm. until, and this amour philistin at the end just comes out of nowhere. It's like, it's like 
It's like the knife in Tosca. Uh. It's not so, because I think she is conflicted between her love for him, her own sexuality, her desires, her possibilities of advancement with the high priest, mm. perhaps. A and her jealousy of his love for God. Exactly. That's the other piece, yeah. Exactly. Well, now, we're all talking about you, my dear. So <laughs> yeah, no, if you said already everything, what should I say? No, no, I mean, no, no, no. Because <laughs> now, now, it's, thing, now so. it's your turn. Who is Dalila, and what is she after? What do you, how, can you describe for us what, what you think of, of the character of Dalila? Uh, well, uh, I think this is a character which is uh, um, full of controversy, emotions, and feelings. Conflict. Yeah, yeah. just conflicts. Um, she's, of course, she's a woman who is very vanish. Uh, vanish, is it true? Uh, vain. Vain, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> She's very vain, and uh, of course she wants she wants all the glory for herself. She wants to to discover the secret of Samson and uh, to help her people, uh, and to be the the main person who who deserves this this glory, and um, everybody should know this. And from another uh, side, uh, she's in love with Samson, I think. She, she admires his, his person, uh, his, um, his way of being, um, um, like this fidelity to God, the mm -hmm. way he's really, he gives himself to this thing. And that's why she's also jealous um, in, in some point. And she feels all this passion to him, and uh, she's uh, constantly fighting between the two sides of two two faces, which which she has. This is interesting because the opening aria of Act Two, which I prefer to Monka, I absolutely love Amour. I I can't pronounce the rest of the title, but I'll just call it Amour. Um, uh, is so wonderful because the music is incredibly passionate. I think the music tells us that she adores him, but the text, she hates him. She's just, you know, talk about conflicted, don't you think? I mean, it, it, you, you, you may feel a little um, schizophrenic singing <laughs> this aria that, because it's so torn, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, some song, Camille uh, uh, Saint-Saëns is, uh, is a composer who perfectly, I think, he perfectly described in his music. So it's not it's not very difficult for you to know the way the the lila should should feel in this point or this point. He perfectly wrote the way she's feeling. I mean, when she's very excited, when she's she she feels something like hate or jealousy, or when she's very loving and very tender. No. It's everything written in the music, and this first aria with with all these syncopes and going up and down and mm -hmm. and faster and slower, it shows the emotional world mm -hmm. of this woman. Mm -hmm. So it perfectly describes what uh, I mean. She's she's not convinced uh, at that point that she's hating him. He, she's not con convinced that she's loving him. So this is this is a fight I, inside. Of I j her. I just think it's one of those wonderful moments in opera that opera can do that no other art form can do in mm -hmm. that the music tells us the truth. Her text does not. Her text not is, is, that, is, not that, always, is not. that conflict, but the music is telling us the God's honest truth that, that she just loves him and wants him. And I, I just think that's such a remarkable moment. Who would have thought, Saint Sans? You know, for the longest time, and maybe it's, it's, maybe I'm just betraying my own weak background, but for the longest time, Sasson's music was kind of poo-pooed, that, uh, yeah. you know, not, not thought of as serious. It's a, very much like Puccini in, in some circles, academic circles, I should say. Looked down upon. But, yeah, yeah. But uh, this is really incredible theater music. And it, it, it really works. Mm. Yeah? It, it must be great fun to work on. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. 
Um, just for all of you, what's the strangest production of Samson and Delilah that you've ever been in or have seen? <laughs> I'm looking at the end of the table, particularly. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> Which one? Well, let's say th that you've actually been in. And you don't have to name names because this is going on YouTube after all. But don't don't name names. That's but the, we, we love all of them. <laughs> we enjoyed every production. We have enjoyed every production. <laughs> in case you're watching. <laughs> and none of them watching. any more than the other one. All of them exactly the same. <laughs> I have to say, um, shortly after 9/11, I was in uh, Bilbao. No, yeah, and doing a production of Samson that led to the next month being in Genoa, Italy. Now, this was in November after the September happenings. And I got there and the director had decided to turn this into a staged depiction of the collapse of the Twin Towers. Uh -huh. uh, Samson was Osama bin Laden. Uh. Oh dear. Oh. Um, we were the uh, Taliban. Uh, and YouTube or not, it was distasteful. Yeah. As I look right at the camera and say that. Yeah. Um, we had continued uh, conflicts with the director over this and he finally left um, and just the fact that somebody would take you know strange aside but the fact that, that something that was that tragic that close at hand mm. would be capitalized upon and exploited was yes. um, very disappointing as a musician, as a human being. Mm. And um, so I, I would have to say you know, that one, you know, that, that above all takes the cake. That really does take the cake. Yeah, That's was, extraordinary. Uh, I uh, can't top that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't imagine Yes, you anybody. can. You crawled out from under her bed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean the story. <laughs> but let me let me answer your question in a different way. Since I can't, nobody can top that distastefulness, even if you try. I mean, we've, I've done things like, you know, with tanks and the Palestinian uh, mm -hmm. occupants. Oh, okay, it's all very passe. Yeah, but, because it takes place in Gaza. But <coughs> it's exactly. ancient I mean, Gaza, after but all. But I want to tell you that a, a very interesting one. Not that the production was so interesting, but I had a chance of singing this opera in Ashkelon which is about 18 kilometers from Samson's birthplace oh. in a Roman amphitheater outside. And the production was normal enough. And I was with, with George Gray, and wonderful tenor. Great. Hi, George. <laughs> and as we're standing, waiting to go on into this incredible venue, so close to the biblical birthplace, we could hear shelling uh. from a distance. Oh my gosh. And it was like, wow, it just doesn't change. Mm. It was an a incredible moment of introspection. The production itself was, I don't even remember what happened. But that is one of those indelible moments. Uh, um, That's cool. Yeah, it was, it was something. It was something interesting. Mm. Yeah, um, Sasson was the organist at L'Église de la Madeleine for 20 years. And I wonder if you hear any of uh, Sasson's church music in, uh, in, this, in this piece, Karen? I, I do, certainly lots in the first act. And I must say throughout <coughs> the score, if you saw the score, I have, I have little places where I've written ugh. O R G E, uh, which is the word for organ. There are chords he creates with the woodwinds and 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 brass uh, that sound literally like organ stops. 
so if you ever wondered about his background, and I th it always fascinates me because I try to take them apart and see how they're orchestrated. I would not have thought to do that, to make that sound, but he did and does. And there are places throughout all three acts that I have made those little notations. It's, it's that, for me, it's that moment just before uh, the old Hebrews prayer. There's a, oh. an introduction mm. to his Absolutely. prayer <laughs> that's yes. in the winds. And every time I hear it, I think, oh, I know what Sasson's doing. He's playing at the offertory. Yes. And he's he's, he's wand because I've had to do it do many, it many times, times myself. It, yes. You know, you're you're going you're covering space. You're yes. just you know going from one moment to the other and hoping the the choir will come in <laughs> when they're supposed to. But it's it's that's so obvious to me. I'm so glad to hear you say that because there are moments like this in the score that I feel exactly the same way as a former organist. Yes. That it's it just sounds well, they, they, they stick sound. out not in a bad way, but they're just arresting, and I yeah. love it. And it's yeah. it's fun to. To discover them or rediscover yeah. them. Um, this this opera also is one of a great tradition of operas based on biblical stories or biblical characters. Strauss's Salome, Schoenberg's Moses und Aaron, Handel's Samson, which is often staged, Verdi's Nabucco, Pizzetti's Deborah e Yael, and we're doing Murder in the Cathedral this year. That's uh, a plug. Rossini's Mosè in Egitto, Massenet's Herodiad. Um, I'd like to challenge your imagination and ask all of you, what biblical story or character do you think would make a great opera? Remembering it's the disreputable characters in the Bible that seem to inspire the greatest works. Well, I mean, if you look at, if you look at the National Enquirer, you see that the disreputable characters everywhere make the news. It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not just an opera. Um, I think those kind of characters are more interesting especially biblical ones, because the biblical, especially the judges, seem to be more, is there a word as unidimensional? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If there isn't, there should be. And um, so therefore, in, in, a, in a way, they are interesting characters for an opera because they're, interest, they're, they're easy enough to deal with. Um, but who would be your favorite? You know, this is a bit weird, but... Um, there's a composer by the name of Simon Sargon. Uh, he lives in Dallas, Texas. And he has written an opera uh, called King Saul. Oh. And it's about uh, uh, Saul's rise to power, Saul's kingship, the conflict between David and Saul. And it is stunning, mm -hmm. I have to say. Mm -hmm. I have to say. But that, that entire... Uh, chapter in Hebrew history with King David and Saul, to me, I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. and, uh, just because of the, the, the anointing of God upon David mm -hmm. and the removal of the anointing by God of Saul and then man's posturing or positioning around to try and thwart <laughs> what's going to happen regardless, you know. Yeah. It's just a, it's an interesting... Uh, Personality. Uh, well, and David is such a fascinating character. I've always thought that Huge. the David and Jonathan story would be fascinating. Yeah. Or Absalom, yeah. the story of Absalom, which would, would also be yeah. really great. Of course, fodder. you'd have to have somebody hang in the tree by their hair. Yeah. That would be... <laughs> it's a great <laughs> stage <laughs> effect. Yes, it's been done. <laughs> I saw a show like that. <laughs> Leslie, do you have any ideas? Actually, in my family, we had absolutely no religious upbringing. So the religion that I know really comes from opera. That um, yeah, I sort of have to be prompted by a story to find it. Hmm. Cain Maybe and Abel. The life of Jesus himself. The life of Jesus himself. Yeah, not like a Jesus super rock star or something. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ, super rock star. Finally, an opera. <laughs> an opera rather yeah. than rather than a musical. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> but there's certainly lots of drama and lots of stories in that life. Yeah. I was trying to remember the name. I'm embarrassed I couldn't. But my Judas. The betrayer of, uh, of the story uh, of Judas. Yeah. yeah, if you're wanting to delve into a character who m must have been terribly conflicted. Yeah, he was a disciple after all, supposedly. Mm -hmm. This has been fascinating. I, w I want to end by just asking each one of you, what's next? Let's start with Nadia. From here, you go. Where I and, go and to St. Gallen, uh, Schweiz, uh, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Switzerland. Yeah, to think uh, concertant. Um, uh, La Force of the, uh, the Power of the Destiny, 
o la forza del destino. Yeah, and then the French Don Carlos in immediately oh. after this in Vienna State Opera. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Leslie? So that's the next. Uh, I do a lot of things in life. I don't just direct operas. I also run performing arts organizations and consult. So the next thing I'm going to be doing is probably to be the interim general manager uh, in a company that needs one. And then the next time I plan on uh, directing an opera would be here. That's right. That's right. Karen? I, I'm going straight to Wagner with Dutchman uh, uh -huh. in Utah. <laughs> In, in okay. Utah? In Utah, yeah. What? Is this our first Wagner? It certainly is. <laughs> wow. It should be interesting. Yeah. But a challenge and one they might be ready for. <laughs> Great. Cliff? I have a, a Valkyrie um, in concert and then a Tristan in Madrid. So. Tristan Great. again, huh? Tristan. Again. Again. The bread and the butter. <laughs> the mortgage. Yeah. <laughs> Can I be your soldier? Please take me. <laughs> Anusha. I go, um, uh, I could, it could be that I go somewhere else, but what's planned at the moment is to go to uh, Leipzig to do another production of uh, Nabucco, ah. which would make um, number 329. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the premiere would be the 329th Nabucco. You know, you could do a lot worse. Yes, you can. That's a yes, yes you can. That's Talk a spectacular about role. Talk about more kids. <laughs> that's a great I role in a great of opera. It it is. It that's is. Exciting. Um, um, it is. It's wonderful. And, and 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 going back to the beginning of this conversation, all of them have been different. All 329 of them are a shade <laughs> are a shade different than the other one. Yeah. Otherwise, there'd be no point in doing it. There you go. Yeah, but that, that's also the beauty about our profession that there is something very Spont spontaneous, yeah. uh, making this, it's, it's every time uh, a challenge, it's every time fresh, it's every time it could be always better, so you, you always um, kind of um, becoming better and better and searching something new. Yeah. Well, I'll give you the last word, Nadia, that was wonderful. Thank you. And thank you all for being here, and thank you. I'll see you at the opera.